Today on Dish with Mary, we're heading east to the charming Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island to explore the original Cajan House, where we'll meet with head chef Brandon Bowers. He and I discuss the storied history of Gahan House being a mercantile in the 1800s and what drew him to becoming a chef. We then recreate the pub's renowned beef melt, a signature dish loved across all six of their East Coast establishments. Ready to savor a coastal classic? Let's dish! To me, cooking should be fun, and finding ways to make it accessible is what motivates me. I love the sizzle of butter melting in a pan, the smell of cinnamon while I'm baking. I need to touch food while it's cooking, and of course, taste it, even if I can't see it very well. The kitchen is my happy place. That's why I'm visiting chefs across Canada who feel the same way I do and inviting them to cook with me in my kitchen. Welcome to Dish with Mary. We're back with another episode of Dish with Mary and today we have Chef Brandon here from Gahan House in Charlottetown. Chef, what are we cooking today? Uh, today we are making our beef melt, which is on our menu in Charlottetown and also all of our locations in the East Coast. That sounds delicious. I want to kind of move over here because we have all our ingredients measured out in front of us. What are we using in the dish? Uh, to start, we're going to be using some sirloin, uh, which we are then going to go to some bacon, some onion, celery, and some carrot, which some people call the holy trinity. Yes. Uh, um, then we have some garlic, balsamic vinegar. Um, we get into our herbs and our seasonings, which are some bay leaves, rosemary, and peppercorns. Okay. We also have some Iron Bridge brown ale, which is one of our beers. We also have some demi-glaze, and then some brown sugar, pepper, and salt. Perfect, and right in front of us, beef sirloin? Yes. Okay, what are we doing with the beef sirloin? Because we've got this pan heating up here. Well, actually, uh, what I'll get you to do is actually put that up a little bit higher for me. Okay. And then what I'll start doing is I'm actually going to break this down into three smaller pieces. Um, and that's really just to help with the cooking process. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to actually season it with all this salt and pepper and brown sugar. Mm, it sounds so good. <laughs> it very much is. So. Don't be scared to season it. You want it nice and heavily seasoned, especially when you're braising something. You really want the seasoning to be heavy on it. So don't be scared of that on any level. So you want to coat all three pieces on every side. And then after this, we're just going to finish it off with a little bit of brown sugar. And that's just going to help that caramelization on the outside of the meat. Um, while that pan's starting to kind of come up to its final temp, we can actually put a little bit of oil in the pan as well. Sure. What do we have here? Uh, that's just your basic canola oil. Okay. How much do you want? Uh, I'd say like two tablespoons should be loads. Okay. There's going to be a lot of fat coming off of this beef and as well as the bacon once we cook it off. Okay. So, like I said, you want to be nice and liberal with all of this seasoning. Now what about the brown sugar? You're doing that, you're being liberal about it as well and you're just kind of rubbing it in? Rubbing it in just because it's not something that, you know, it's not like salt and pepper that'll stick to right. the meat. Um, so you want to kind of get that rubbed in and what happens is it naturally starts to melt um, with the heat of your skin, basically. And you're just coating it really, really liberally. And then what I'll get you to do uh, while I wash my hands Absolutely. is I'll get you to actually sear this off. Okay, perfect. I'll take that. Let me perfect. grab a pair of tongs here. I'm just going to wash my hands. That is definitely the sound you're looking for. <laughs> How long would you say? You're really just looking to get a nice little crust on the outside of each piece. Mm -hmm. So about a minute to two minutes on uh, each side okay. is more than enough. So yeah, I'd say we can probably look at these sides if we want to pick up one. And we just flip it over and I'll take a quick look at it. Now, what about... That's beautiful. Sound. So we're going to do all sides. We're going to brown each side of it. Yep. So... Mm. I want to say maybe, what, a couple of minutes per side? Yeah, if that. If you've got a nice yeah. hot pan. The sugar is what really helps the process and, and speed it up. Every time you flip this, you can just, you can basically hear that sizzle coming out, like mm -hmm. just like that. That's all that sugar hitting the pan, mm. and it's just melting off into the pan, so that, it's just basically creating our first layer of flavor. So those are all looking great, and I think we can pull those off and set them on the plate. Honestly, I could just dig in at this point. But I know there's so much more to come. So we have this plate. You're going to want to waste. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And then after we pull it out, we can actually just take the pan down a little bit. Let me put this aside. And then we're going to lower the yeah. temperature on we're the pan. We're just going to take the temperature down a little bit to about a medium heat. Okay. And then we're just going to add all this bacon in and just break that up. And you don't have to have the bacon, you know, you're not, you're make, you're not making bacon bits. It doesn't have to fully crisp. Okay. You're just looking to render out that fat a little bit. Okay. It'd probably take about five minutes. Okay, perfect. Well, now why don't I be your sous chef and you yeah, take over here absolutely. and I'll hand you everything. Let me walk around, okay. It's already starting to brown. Yeah. All that sugar is still caramelized in that pan. And then we're gonna start to see that fat really start to render out. So we're about, I'd say about 30 seconds here. Okay. And what I'll take next is I'm gonna go with um, the onion, the celery, and the carrots all at the same time and right into the pan. Holy Trinity. Yes. Which I'll take that anytime now. All right, perfect. So I'll grab the onion. All of it is going in? All of it. Let me get the celery here. And then once we kind of get the onion, the celery, and the carrot, these vegetables are a little cold. So you might want to pull up your heat a little bit just to kind okay. of get that, that sweating action going. Let and all you're, looking, mm -hmm. all you're looking for when you're cooking your onion, your celery, and your carrot is what we call sweating. You just want to get that little bit of a bite out of the vegetables. Okay. Um, and basically you're just starting to release their natural flavors into the, into the pan as well. Okay. And the chop that you have, it's a very, it's a fine dice. It, it is, it's a fine or, dice, but to be honest, with something like this, it's almost like a stock. Like what you are creating this, with yeah. this is braising liquid. Okay. Um, and, and, and it truthfully and honestly, there's times when I make this, I don't peel the carrots, the celery leaves go in there, the, the onion peels, everything goes in. It's all flavor right. and it can all be used. So even at this point, your onion, it should be just starting to, at this point, just become almost a little translucent. Okay. Um, which then in turn, you can just feel, even by touching your spoon to it, that there's a little bit of give to it. Same thing with the celery and the carrot. You know, those are your little bit of a harder veg, but the celery actually cooks pretty quick. Um, and same thing with the carrot when it's got this little bit of a dice on it. And is that because the celery's got a little more water base? Yeah, so it? the celery especially, the, the onion not so much. Yeah. And it also depends on the onion you're using. We're just using a basic white onion in this, but I've Which used... Which is perfect. Yeah, I've used Spanish onions in it as well. Um, so right here you can start to hear the, the actual sizzle is coming out now. Yes. So what's happened now is we've now cooked out a lot of the liquid that was in the vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, so now we know at this point that we're past the sweating stage. So now we know that we have sweated Ooh, our I vegetables like that. Yeah. off. Yeah. So now if if you even see at the bottom of the pan a little bit, there's all, it's now not even any liquid. So we're basically at the stage where we can actually add our garlic, okay. which is a little bit of a piece away. Would you like me to grab it? Sure. Yeah, it's a little far away. So this next this next couple stages, yes. it is a quick process to get in the pan and move on to the next stage because you don't want to overcook these things. Okay. So next we'll add in some garlic. Now you just slice that up. I just sliced it because once again, ideally once you get to the process of making the meat, pulling it out and everything, you're going to strain off all the liquid anyway. Yep. Hence why I'll use onion peels. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so next I'll take the rosemary and the bay leaves and the peppercorns. Absolutely. And same thing, we're just gonna cook those off a little bit in the pan. So what do we got, just about one sprig of rosemary, a yep. couple of bay leaves or just one bay leaf? Just there? one bay leaf I guess and then the size. it's about a teaspoon, maybe a little bit more peppercorns. Okay. And we'll just cook that off a little bit and then the next thing I will take is there's a little bowl there with some balsamic vinegar in it. Oh, I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I love the smell of balsamic. And then I will also take the uh, beer, which are Iron Bridge Brown Ale. Okay. Now, what would you? I'm gonna take a little. It's got like a. You want to try it? No. I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say the flavor profile of that beer is that you're adding into it? It's got like a deep. It's very deep. It's very rich. Um, I actually one of my favorite things to do with Iron Bridge is bake. I use oh. it, I'll use it with chocolate a lot, and it's, it's very, very, very good. 
So then that should be enough beer for us. And then okay. I'll take next is our demi glaze, which is already reduced over there. And how much beer do you say we added? Roughly. Uh, roughly, I'd say about a cup and a half. Okay. And then demi glaze. And demi glaze. That's for you, chef. Thank you. And then at this point, we're we're just going to bring this up to a boil. Anytime you're dealing with any type of braising liquid or stock, if you let that reduce and then you add to it, you're just adding more flavor. Yeah, yeah. So eyes of the beholder, you can do whatever you please. Uh, but at the same time, once we have this up to the boil, it's going to be in the oven for close to three hours anyway. Okay. So that's going to reduce beautifully in the first place. And so we're now boiling. So we can just set that beef right on top of all of the vegetables and the seasoning. And we're just gonna cover it. And we're gonna put it in the oven. All right, so while our pan is hanging out in the oven, we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, we're gonna visit Chef Brandon in Charlottetown. But first, a quick kitchen tip. So the best way to cook your meats, Take the meat out of the refrigerator 30 minutes or longer if you have the time before you cook it. The closer it gets to room temperature, the more evenly it'll cook. When the meat is cooked, let it rest. Whether it's off the grill or out of the oven, you wanna let it rest to keep those juices intact. Dish with Mary will be right back. We're back to visit Chef Brandon at Gahan House in Charlottetown on Dish with Mary. I love the salty breezes of the East Coast. So this summer I went down to Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island to take them in. I met up with Chef Brandon at Gahan House and delved into the history of the restaurant and the path he took to becoming a chef. So I wanna know all about you and how you got into cooking, how you became a chef. Is this something you always wanted to do? Uh, absolutely. Um, when I was a kid, uh, starting I think at the age of four, that was generally, it was like instant. Um, my dad was a chef on Prince Edward Island. I grew up in kitchens. I started when I was like, I think 10 years old was my first job in a kitchen doing dishes. I spent, you know, the next three years or so just kind of working my way through the industry. By the time I get into high school, I, I started uh, my first cooking job. Um, unfortunately, getting asked to leave high school, um, I got to take on the job full time um, and spent the next 10 years in that same restaurant working and uh, eventually took my first sous chef position uh, by the time I was like 17 and just kept working and kept working. And so I'm now 34, so that's a long time to be in kitchens. What was that journey like? Well, 15 years. Yeah, so when I started cooking, uh, it was terrifying, uh, but also it was all I wanted to do. It started basically because I was working in a restaurant as a dishwasher. Um, the cook that was working there that night had sent everybody home. It was a slow night. Mm -hmm. Prince Edward Island, it's feast or famine when it comes to the seasons. So it was a slow night, he sent everybody home and then all of a sudden we had a surprise bus tour show up um, of like 60 people that we did not know was coming. And he came back and just looked at me and he said, listen, we've got a bus tour that just showed up. I, I need your help. He's like, but just do what I tell you and, and you'll be fine. So I went up, he had no knowledge that this was a, a, a goal of mine to do this. I went up and I just did what I was told and then we finished up and he looked at me and said, you know, you did unbelievable, like, would you ever think about doing this? And I said, it's all I've ever wanted to do and he went to the chef at the time and within two weeks I started cooking and the industry itself was the only calling that I ever felt. Cooking was really the only option that I seen in the end, uh, but at the same time, I've now been doing it for so many years that like, there's, you know, there's trying times with any industry or any job that you do, and there's been times where I've stepped back uh, and have, have thought about leaving the industry and moving on to something different, but I can't imagine. I feel so comfortable, I know what to do, I'm, 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 I love the people, I love the environment, and it's, it's absolutely the only thing that was an option, some would say predetermined, I guess. Was there anyone that inspired this decision? Um, it would be my father, for sure. 
I think it was just embedded in me. Like it was just in my blood. Like it, we, you know, you're such a, a rare person to do this style of work. And I think it was just, like I said, it was predetermined through him that it was just passed down to me uh, without any type of agreement between the two of us that it was gonna happen. It, it just, it pushed me uh, so much in the industry. And, and I think I was trying to prove it to myself more than anybody else that I could do it. I mean, and one thing we kind of just tapped on really lightly, and if you're comfortable talking about it, I wanna talk about mental health. Yep. People will just see you here in front, in the business, doing your thing, but there's a lot that no one sees that goes on behind the scenes that is taxing on someone. How did you find this experience? When you talk about mental health, what did you struggle with in that moment in time when you said, I had to kind of step back and think, do I continue, don't I? So really what the main cause of it was, was I, I am a recovering addict. Uh, I've now been uh, sober for 11 years. Congratulations. Thank you. That is amazing. Yeah. Uh, the 10 years before that though, not so much. <laughs> I was in the industry and it was very difficult for me to grow mentally, physically, spiritually and, and, and professionally. It was a massive hindrance. Um, we talk about really the demons that you battle with and everybody's got them it's and it's just a matter of how you, you kind of can deal with them and when i was a child i went through a lot of trauma um, and it led to me kind of going down that path of of looking for an escape and i found it um, so i spent the next 10 years kind of dealing with that and eventually what had happened was i hit a point where i was done and and whether that was going to be with drinking and using or if it was going to be i was just done with life um, that was basically the, the crossroads i had hit at that point and um, fortunately um, i have an amazing family who are an amazing support to me at all times so i had struggled with mental health my whole life from when i was a child up to this point um, and had made a promise to my mother at a very young age that if i ever felt that i was going to do that that I would call her, and I called her that day, um, very reluctantly, but she came and got me, and that started my path of sobriety, um, which then, you know, was a lot of work, and it was a lot of years of um, digging inside myself and finding out about my demons and, and, and learning to live with them, but also learning to um, control my emotions because that's a massive part of, of it as well. Um, but also not being scared of my emotions and not being scared of, 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 of yeah. these demons yeah. and not letting them control me. Uh, but the, the big thing that happened with the industry itself, and I feel like this is what a lot of people deal with in general, is it is a very stressful and chaotic environment, um, and it can, it can weigh on you pretty hard. Um, and at that time, that was what my fear was, is personally as a recovering addict, knowing that stress and anger and all these things are things that can push me back to my addictions, I was scared that the industry was going to do that. I, I really started wanting to put a focus on being there for people that are struggling with these things because mm -hmm. it's prevalent whether you go through trauma like the stress is rough on the industry as a whole um, so you know addiction and using can can really run rampant throughout the industry I actually set out quite a few years ago and had started a uh, benefit dinner uh, during addictions week where mm -hmm. I actually started um, just, you know, it was a night where we could have everybody in, ticket sales, go all to addiction services on PEI. Um, oh my gosh, I love this. Yeah, and we, we, we focused on this and, and also, but trying to tie in that message of uh, everybody in the industry on some level is dealing with whatever it is, uh, mental health, addictions, or, or just time, like just life balance, any of it. So I would always talk about this and I, I still try and talk about it with my team because it's it's one of those situations that you don't have to make the mistakes that I made. I've already made them for you. So just- And you're giving them exactly, the opportunity I'm just learned from what I did, yeah. And I think that's important is because you're sharing that it's okay to talk about this. You don't need to keep it in. Yeah. And I love that you're sharing the story and thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I, for one, am very happy that mm -hmm. you made that phone call. Thank you. I think, I think most people are. 
After the break, we're back in the kitchen to create some barbecue sauce for our beef melt on Dish with Mary. We now return to Dish with Mary. Welcome back to Dish with Mary. We are all set up and ready to make the Iron Bridge barbecue sauce. And we had such a good time when I came out to visit you in Charlottetown. It was great. I was glad you guys could come down. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. But what are we starting with? Uh, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to caramelize uh, some onion, just like you would if you were making a French onion soup. Mm -hmm. so basically, you're looking to create a really natural sugar flavor out of those onions. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to start with a little bit of oil in the pan, which you want to be around a medium to high heat. And what oil are you using? Just canola oil in this. Canola, you, can okay. use, you can use olive, uh, but our pan is beautifully hot here. The oil's just moving a little bit. Okay. Um, so now we'll take some butter. Which I'll grab that for you. Perfect. So you've got some diced butter. Salted, yeah. unsalted, doesn't matter. This, it really does, doesn't. If you're going to use salted, just watch your salt content go, going into the dish. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this is unsalted. So then we're just going to get that butter. If you hear too much noise in the pan, you want to take it back a little bit because you don't want to brown your butter because it gets that nutty flavor to it. Okay. But now that we have our butter melted with the oil, I'll take some onion. I will get that. Which I sliced these as thin as I possibly could okay. to help the process along of caramelization, which at this point, we're just going to move them around to get them nice and coated in the oil and the butter. And then one of the key things to when you're caramelizing onion is once you have the pan started, you just want to hear that little bit of action. That's what I would call it in a pan. Okay. It's just a little bit of action. You hear that little gentle sizzle. That's what you want. And you just want to let it cook. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't talk to it. Don't do it and let it do its thing. Don't move it. <laughs> <laughs> so just let it do its thing, because what you'll do is you'll release those natural sugars out of the onion, mm -hmm. and then you're going to create all that sugar on the bottom of the pan, and then when you finally do go to stir it, which the process can take anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to really get it done properly, okay. uh, then when you stir it, it's gonna all that natural sugar is going to lift, and then the onion is just going to be basically a caramelized ball of goodness, which I think you remember onion and butter. That's, mm. that's, that's your, back that's to your it. thing yeah, right there. We're coming back to it that's already. That's it right there. Yeah. So I think our onions are getting very, very close here. Um, as, as you can smell, mm -hmm. it's very sweet smell that's coming out, mm -hmm. which is what we really, really want at this point. Um, all of our moisture is really starting to cook out and those natural sugars are there. Um, you can almost feel the weight of the onions because they become so heavy from the sugar, mm -hmm. um, which is really what you want, want to find when you're doing this. Uh, so this next step, I think we're ready for Mary. I think we'll actually take some garlic next. <gasps> Fantastic. That's my job. Let me hang you this garlic. So you've gone ahead and just minced it up. I just minced it up and you don't have to be scared of, uh, being a little heavy on the garlic in this. Um, because this is a barbecue sauce, so it's going to have a lot of complex flavors coming okay. together. Um, which, with the garlic, you don't want to cook it too, too long, though. You only want it for that 30 seconds or so. And those onions are going to continue to caramelize as we're going through this process. Okay. Um, and then once I can smell that garlic, I'm going to ask you to hit me with beer. Beer. Yeah. There we go. So we're using our Iron Bridge Brown Ale again. Okay. We're doubling up. It's just very dark, rich flavoring, which is great for a barbecue sauce. I'm going to about, about a cup and a half to two cups in here. And then once we hit this point, we want to lift up all that, all that caramelized fond on the bottom of the pan. Mm -hmm. We're just going to lift that up. And then we're actually going to take our heat up a little bit and we're going to look to bring this to a boil and we'll actually want to maybe even reduce it by half uh, just to bring out even more rich and complex flavors. Okay, now I always ask this because do you want just like a low boil or do you want like a rolling boil? For, where... for something like this, I would actually bring it up and then kind of pull it back a little okay. bit if I wanted to. All right, now that we're up to a rolling boil, mm -hmm. you can smell it, it smells delicious. And I can definitely hear it. Yes, you can. Um, right now, we're just going to pull it off to the side and we're going to actually blend all of these onions because we don't want to lose any of it. We want it all to stay in our sauce. So we're actually going to pull it off to the side here, just so away from the, the heat. heat. Yep. <laughs> and then we're just going to take our immersion blender 
and we're just gonna puree all that onion and beer, which is definitely a sentence I never thought I would say in my cooking <laughs> career. Now, if you don't have an immersion blender, what can we use? You could use a regular blender. You could use um, a food processor. Obviously, being careful when you do that because you're going to be pulling the liquid and the onion out of the pot and it's yep. going to be hot. Uh, but then going right back in um, to the pot uh, to finish it off, it would be completely fine. But you also have the option that you do not need to puree it. You can just leave the sliced caramelized onion in the sauce. So uh, instead of slicing it, give it a fine dice? Dice, or yeah, or you can even leave it sliced, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always, I always think about pureeing as uh, when I was a kid. Um, I didn't like onion. So when my mother made yeah. gravy, she, she still made gravy with onion, but she would always kind blend of puree it or blend it or something to get it out or strain it off, which was fine. But yeah. So now we're going to come back on. So were you a picky eater? I was. Okay. I was very picky. Eater. A lot of chefs were picky eaters. I don't think I, I don't think I ate lettuce until I was like twelve years old, <laughs> as a chose. No greens, no greens. <laughs> yeah. So what do we have going on now? All right. So now that we've got everything pureed, we're just going to start adding in the rest of our wet liquids. Okay. Um, so I'll take uh, some apple cider vinegar there. Yep. I'll grab that. How much of this are we adding? Uh, right now, this is about a cup to a cup and a half. Depends on how much you like it acidic. I like it quite acidic, so I want that. So you're whisking as we're adding in yep. the liquids, okay, just to keep everything moving around. And I'll pull back the heat at this point to about a medium high heat as well. Okay. And then next, I'm going to take the classic barbecue ingredient, ketchup. Ketchup. <laughs> and we're just going to dump all of that in there. About two cups. This is a, exactly, it's two cups. And this barbecue sauce, when it's completed, it's actually a little bit more on the runny side. It's not so much uh, very thick barbecue sauce. Okay. So if you're making it and you notice there's not a crazy amount of resistance when you're moving it, that's not to worry about because you're actually almost creating what I like to say is like a mop sauce. It's gonna be a little bit runnier. Okay. So next we'll take the brown sugar. I was already leaning for it. Yeah. And with all the acidic flavors that we have in here, there's also obviously a lot of sweet flavors. Okay. Um, with the caramelization of the onions and then adding the brown sugar, and then into my favorite part of this dish uh, would be next is the molasses. This is liquid gold. Yep. <laughs> and this is about, you know, half a cup of molasses. So would you say that that would be, that ingredient right there would be essential to any good barbecue sauce? Um, to be honest, yes. I, I, I've made a lot of barbecue sauces without it, but as you, as, as, as you add this molasses, yeah. it's going to darken and richen it up even more, and that's kind of the big reason that I wanted to do it. Yeah. It really helps balance out the amount of vinegar that I put into it. Yes, okay. Um, so, yeah, like that is an unbelievable color. It almost looks like... Uh, it, like it literally looks like what we just cooked the meat like as like it's it's got that rich dark yeah. red color to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And that's that's what we're looking for. So next, I'll actually take I have a little bit of a mixture there of paprika yep. and some chili powder. Yep. Now the paprika smoked sweet. Uh, so I generally actually use smoked for this barbecue sauce. Yep. Next, we're gonna finish it off with just a little bit of salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. I will hand you that. Perfect. And I go a little bit heavier on the pepper on this than I do the salt. Um, and you also, I would suggest using fresh cracked pepper, not just ground black pepper, um, but that's just a personal preference. And at this state, even, uh, even though it's not fully complete, when it's cooking, it's gonna reduce down that those flavors yep. are gonna richen. But I, I know what it should be kind of at at this point, so I'm actually so gonna we can try go a little it. bit. Yes, we can. Can I give it a little taste? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh my God. Mm. Molasses mm. is the first thing you get. I'm a happy dance because yeah. this, <laughs> you do get the molasses, but I love the little tang. Yeah, yep. Yeah. It's just so the back subtle, of the but it, yeah, yeah, it's right just the enough. The yep. Yeah. And then at this point, you're basically, you, depending on how thick you want your barbecue sauce, you can just let it reduce down. We'll probably let it cook for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll generally let it cool before we go on to the next step. So while we let our barbecue sauce cook down, we're gonna take a quick break, we'll be right back. And now, a quick kitchen tip. 
Sharpen those knives. A sharp knife is actually safer than a dull knife and it'll cut down your prep time. You can sharpen your knives at home or you can take them to your local kitchen supply store. After the break, we finish up our beef melt on Dish with Mary. We now return to Dish with Mary. Welcome back to Dish with Mary. We've pulled our beef out of the oven. We have it resting on the counter right now. What are we doing next, Chef? Well, next we're gonna be looking to actually take some of that beef out, and we're actually going to look to shred it up. So this is cooked, and it's cooked to about a hundred, and a minimum of 190 degrees is what you're looking for. Okay. Because that's when all that connective tissue on the inside breaks down completely. So then what I'll ask you to do, if you can, Mary, is to take those two forks and just shred up that beef into some nice pulled pork-esque pieces. And then while, Perfect. You're, okay. while you're doing that, I'm actually going to take some of this sourdough bread and butter it, and we're going to actually toast it off in the pan. So with the butter, I'm gonna toast, or I'm just gonna butter on one side of it, and I'm not gonna be scared of the butter. Uh, best part of a grilled cheese, in my opinion, is the butter on the bread. Uh -huh. So that's kind of what we're gonna be doing. Uh, so I have my pan heating on the stove here. Do you want one of these? You have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> so I'm just checking for heat, which the heat is around a medium. I don't want it to be too, too hot. And I'm gonna put a little bit of canola oil in the pan mm -hmm. as well. Okay. And I'm just gonna move that to see if our oil is nice and hot, which it is. So then I'm gonna put my butter buttered bread into the pan. And just listen for that little bit of action, mm -hmm. which is what I want. I don't want it to be too wild. I'd say one of the number one mistakes I see people make when they're doing things like this mm -hmm. is not adjusting as they go. Okay. So listening for the, for the action as you add something that it's gonna cool down a little bit. So if you have to adjust your, your pan to bring it back up, whereas you want a little bit more action from what I'm hearing here. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna bring up the, the heat a little bit. Can I start on the aioli? Uh, yes, so we're gonna make a honey Dijon aioli. Okay. Uh, so right, it's, it's, it's straightforward and to the point. We've got honey, some grainy Dijon, a little bit of garlic, and you're just gonna mix that together. Perfect, so I've got probably about a cup and a half. Yeah, it's, I'd say it's just about over a cup mayo right here. Let me add in some garlic. How's your bread coming along? It is toasting beautifully. I want it, especially with sourdough, it can be a little bit of a softer bread. Mm -hmm. um, so I want it to toast really, really nice because the meat, the peppers, the onions, the barbecue sauce, the cheese, every, it's gonna be a heavy, heavy dish. So it's right. gotta have a good foundation to it. So I'm okay. really looking to toast this really nice so that it crisps up beautifully. So I've got all my ingredients into the mayonnaise. I'm gonna whisk this up. So now once aioli's made, we've shredded our beef, um, bread's ready, yep. what's the next step? Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna take our bread out of the pan and I'm gonna add a little bit of oil back into the pan and I'm gonna saute off some mushrooms, onions and peppers in with a little bit of that beef. Okay. And then I'm gonna deglaze that pan with a little bit of the barbecue sauce we made. So I'm just gonna flip this bread and it's Aioli's ready to go. Perfect. So then once our bread is nice and toasted, which it'll take less time on the other side because there's no butter. Okay. And we're just gonna set it off on the, uh, off to the side on a pan. I'm gonna pull back the heat just a tiny little bit. I don't want the pan ripping, smoking hot. Yep. And then I'm just gonna add a little bit of oil again. About a tablespoon to two tablespoons. Okay. And if you could pass me the onion there, which Absolutely. is in the center. Perfect. I always start with an onion. Okay. Always start with onion. Always start with <laughs> yeah. an Okay, why always start with the onion? Uh, a chef that I work for actually used to say everything good starts with an onion. So I just force a habit, I do it. I'll take the peppers next as well. Okay. And I'm kind of feeling like onion and butter is your love language right here. It, it really, really <laughs> is. Onion and fat, to be honest, yeah. it's just it's, it's exactly where I want it to be. Um, and then I'll take some mushrooms next. So we just added, what, some sliced red 
bell pepper. Sliced, sliced bell peppers to us. Okay. Which you can use red, green, yellow, it doesn't orange, matter. doesn't matter. I mean, if you want to put jalapenos in there, you can as well, but. Mm, a little thick. <laughs> exactly. And there's the mushrooms. Thank you. These are what, just sliced? Sliced button mushrooms. Button mushrooms. Yeah. So then I'm not going to cook this down in the pan too, too long. I want a little bit of bite to the vegetables as we go to finish it in the oven with the barbecue sauce as well. Okay. So it's really only going to be about a minute to two minutes that I'm looking to do this. And then at this point, what I'm actually going to do now is add some of this beef. Oh. Now we're talking. So that then, beef is so good. <laughs> so then this is where it gets fun. You can add as much or as little as you want. Okay. We're going to add all of it. Amazing. Right into the pan on top of everything. Yep. And then I'm going to mix it all together and just to kind of make sure it's up to a good temperature. And oh, just... it looks and smells fantastic. Okay, absolutely. Mm. So it won't take too long at this point. You're really just looking to get that beef up to temperature after shredding it a little bit. And like I said, you can start, you can tell, you tell your mushrooms are starting to break down a little bit. Your peppers and onions, they're just sweated a little bit. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna take, for the best part, in my opinion, yeah. is the barbecue sauce, which I'll just grab a small ladle of it over here. Perfect. And we've been letting uh, it reduce for a little bit. And then. And it is a fairly loose yep, barbecue absolutely. sauce. And one of the key reasons to that as well is because once we add it to this this stage, yep. it's gonna rapidly heat up and all the sugars that we added to it, because there's molasses, brown sugar, the sugar that's coming out of the onion, all of that is now, if you look, the beef just soaked all of it up. There's no liquid in the pan, yep. even though I just added about you know four to six ounces of it. Yeah and it's just completely broken right down into the actual meat and the peppers and onions and mushrooms. And that's why you want to keep it moving. Yeah. So nothing sticks to the bottom I, yeah, of the pan because it's fairly dry. Yeah, and I don't want it to burn. That's yeah. the big thing too, all the sugar that is in it. All right, so now what we'll do is we'll just add this to our sourdough. We're just gonna put it right on top here. So I'm just gonna put the cheese on top. And we're gonna put two slices on. Of course. Why not? I mean, I can put three. Well, we'll leave one for us to snack on. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. And we're just gonna go straight into the oven with this. And this oven is on a broil, because mm -hmm. we wanna put it on that top rack to really caramelize that cheese. How long are we keeping that in there? About two minutes is what we're looking at. Perfect. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back. More from my trip to Charlottetown when we come back on Dish with Mary. We now return to Dish with Mary. I want to talk a little bit about Gahan House. So can you tell me a little bit of the history? Where we are right now, is this the original part? This is the original uh, Gahan House. So to make it even more original as to what it is, Gahan itself is named after a merchant named John Gahan. He was a merchant on Prince Edward Island that sold a lot of goods. He actually sold spirits and wines during Prohibition out of this building. So it was kind of hand in hand that it made sense that if we're gonna open a brewery that we're gonna call it the Gahan House. This building used to be a hospital at one point. The brewery was an operating room. Um, and this was where he did it, was this building. So this is a historic landmark in Charlottetown. The brewery itself started in this building 27 years ago, and the restaurant followed a year later, which our mission has always been to just have that classic pub feel, but also elevate that opportunity to make sure that we're giving guests fresh dishes, because we don't want to be a franchise. That's the other aspect of it. We want to be a family. We want to work together to cultivate our menus. We want to work together to cultivate even the experience from when you call the restaurant and what that answer on the phone is. So are you the executive chef or head chef of all the restaurants? Uh, not necessarily. I'm the head chef of Cajon Charlottetown, but I also have recently just taken on a role called culinary operations manager. Um, so I'm a base, basically assisting in, in, in helping all the Gahan chefs. And, you know, when we talk about the menu development process, many people think that, you know, the executive chef 
position is there just to dictate those menus, uh, but that's why it's very important that it's, it's a culinary operations role, that I'm there to help and grow these chefs and then help the process along. If someone were to ask, what type of cuisine do you serve at Cajon House? Classic pub. Classic pub, just elevated. That's what we're, that would be the best way to, to define it. Um, if you're gonna get that classic pub dish of having a calamari, most places are buying that frozen calamari and dropping it, not us. We're buying the squid, we're portioning it, we're breading it to order, and just making sure we put that elevated experience into it. They're very, very specifically done, and it takes more time. It is a very strenuous pro process at this point, but it's worth it in the end because of what we see going out to the guests. So it's just classic pub food, but elevated. Why is it so important to combine the brewery into the menu? I think the reasoning behind it more than anything is that it started as a brewery. The pub was kind of something that came after the fact and then just making sure that we're combining those two things and mothering them and, and that they're a cohesive unit. So it was very important to us even when we opened all other six locations, they are all microbreweries as well that have their own brew houses in in every single location if you look at our menus it's got pairing suggestions from the brewer the brewer's name is on the menu just to, just like the gm and the chef because they're just important to the business a well-crafted beer and when it's done properly can be then used even within food and paired with food to be just as close to being uh, an experience as wine so that that's really important to us as well You've got two very different clientels. You've got the tourist season, and then you've got locals all year round. How do you balance that menu process? To be honest, I think the best part about, specifically with Cajon Charlottetown, is that we have been here for so long. So we, we, we've actually kind of carved out a very good customer base and loyal customer base that we've helped them learn more about food. And that's, that's been very important to us as well. Uh, but at the same time, I think the biggest thing that is is just really ensuring that what I'm giving is just as the authentic as I possibly can. And mm -hmm. that's that's what is going to constantly make sure my my local clientele are happy, but also that my my tourist clientele are just as happy. So what's next for Brandon and Gahan? I'd say the next thing we're really going to want and what I would want is for us to continue to grow. But that's not only just as locations, but also our teams and, and myself. It's just constantly pushing, you know, nothing would make me happier than having a sous chef at a location take on a chef role or, or line cooks step into sous chef roles. That growth aspect of things is so important, but also as the brand itself, constantly pushing ourselves to elevate our menus, constantly pushing ourselves to look for the next market that makes sense for us. Thanks so much for having us, for sitting with me, sharing your story, sharing your journey, and all about Kahan. It's my pleasure. We finished making Brandon's open-faced beef white cheddar milk with a generous drizzle of aioli and garnished with basil. If you're interested in making Chef Brandon's beef melt, you can find the full recipes from all our episodes at ami.ca. Brandon, thank you so much for sharing your story with me, sharing your recipe, cooking with me today. I had so much fun. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So we're going to dig in? Absolutely. I want to say goodbye to everyone at home. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Dish with Mary. Until next time. Production services provided by Frank Digital. Hosted by me, Mary Mamaliti. Guest chef, Brendan Bowers. Producers, Chris McIver, Libby Lee. Director, Chris McIver. Director of Photography, Braden Music. Food stylist, Amanda Bebo. Produced in association with Accessible Media, Inc. Integrated described video consultant, M. Williams. Supervising producer, Michelle Dudas. Copyright 2023. An AMI original production.